Perfect. Um, all right, so let's call the meeting to order 534. Um, all right, first order of business is the review of the academic calendar. Um, Ms. Ken, take it away. Sure, so um, hold on, I have it right here. So you were sent this in the materials for the meeting, um, but we have a proposed calendar for next year that we would like to run by you and have you hopefully vote on so that you could bring it to the full committee on the 25th. I will show it here, but you should have seen it in the materials that were sent to you. Um, a couple of just quick highlights. Um, we will be returning to having both the Friday and Monday after Labor Day off. Um, we have moved the, what we call professional development or teacher days to Wednesdays and that's to um, fulfill principals requests because they were, some of them were on the same day as faculty meetings, um, which extended the time for professional learning, but at the same time, the principals lost a faculty meeting. So instead we've separated those. So you'll see that the, the yellow triangles are now on Wednesdays instead of on Tuesdays, but the day would end as a normal time for teachers on that day. So any after school meetings like union meetings or anything else could still be held. Um, Everything else is pretty much the same. Um, I was saying to a group this afternoon um, that I love it when Good Friday lands on the Friday before vacation um, in April. That's always a bonus. Um, and we have, you know, Indigenous Peoples Day and we also have Juneteenth here. Anybody have any questions or anything? So I right. do think you need to vote to take it to the full committee. This is the one thing we need to vote on. Yeah, um, we we usually vote at the end for everything, right? I think because the the advisory committee also has to be sent. Um, but I mean, I, I guess we can we can just do a you know. Do I have a motion to move this to the committee? Motion. Just submit this. Say it again. Uh, I heard Kelly make the motion. Um, Marisol, is that a second? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Um, any opposed? Seeing none, moved, so moved. Um, all right, so next on the item, next on the agenda, um, what, what was that, the item again? I'm yeah. sorry that so I- So the next up. item on the agenda is, um, I have invited Christina DiCaligero, who is uh, here. She is our STEM coordinator, grades five through 12. And she is here to talk about a new financial literacy course at the high school. So Christina, I've given you sharing rights and let me just frame it while you get your slides up. Um, a couple of years ago, when we had a lot of budget cuts going on, not now, but <laughs> before, um, we actually, if you remember correctly, we eliminated the business department because the business department was teaching some financial literacy and some other things, but it was really antiquated. Um, we were using red pens and black pens and balancing checkbooks and things like that. So we, as part of the budget cuts, the business department, we kept a couple of faculty members that moved into other departments, but the business department as an entity went away. So I believe it was last year or, yeah, I think it was last fall, um, Kelly, I think it was you who said, hey, we really need a financial literacy course um, at the high school. You know, we understand why. So. Christina has worked really hard to design a course um, that is much more modern um, and much, you know, more going with the times now of, you know, online banking and all that kind of thing. Um, and she's going to walk you through it. Um, and we are going to be um, starting this course in the fall. And this is just to let you know, um, but this request actually came from this committee. Um, and I just wanted to follow through and show you what was in store. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, Christina. All right, thank you. This um, is so exciting. <laughs> I'm so, happy. Christina, do you, can you guys just quickly introduce yourself to Christina? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, hi, Christina. I'm Roberto. I'm uh, at large school committee member um, and chair of the subcommittee. Kelly, do you want to go ahead? 
door. Hi, Christina. My name is Kelly Garcia, and I am, oh, Kelly Garcia Mirza. Just got married a couple months ago. Still getting used to the last name. Um, and I am the chairwoman of the Chelsea School Committee. So happy to have you here with us. I'm also on auntie duty, so that's why I'm no face. No, <laughs> I have five kids running around, so no yeah. problem. <laughs> Rosemary, do you want to introduce yourself? Um, all right, maybe Rosemary needs a second. Marisol, do you want to say hi? Marisol Santiago, uh, Chelsea School Committee member, District 3. And mom of a, of a Chelsea public school student. <laughs> yes, I'm a little one in Berkeley. <laughs> So why don't you let Christina run through, she only has a few slides to share with you. So let her run through her spiel and then she'll take any questions you may have. Perfect. So thank you for having me. I'm very excited about this course. Um, as Sarah mentioned, this course is um, expected to begin this fall. It's an elective course that will be taught through our math department. It will be available to all students at every grade level. It will also be available every quarter and it will run five days a week. Um, and it will be taught primarily by a teacher in addition to some online um, interactive learning programs that are offered through EverFi. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that will look like um, in the presentation. Um, so a little bit about why we really need to be thinking about giving our students an opportunity to um, become proficient and with financial literacy. Um, high school is the ideal time when um, students are thinking about a career path. They're thinking about their future. They're going to be making decisions on you know, purchasing things. They're going to be thinking about college and loans. Um, so it's important that before they leave high school, they have an opportunity to really explore and have a good understanding of what it means to be financially literate. Um, the data suggests that as well, EverFi, which is a nonprofit organization, did a survey, a recent survey for students and parents, um, just around the need of being financial literate by the time you leave high school. Um, and the data shows that 68% of high school students don't understand credit scores. 59% of employees say that financial matters are one of their top causes of stress. 40% adults can't pay for an unexpected emergency or expense. And 65, and I think this is really telling, um, and really the root and purpose of this course is 65% of recent college graduates didn't know how much money they had borrowed from college. And 50% of them felt that they probably would have made a different decision in what school they chose to go to if they had known how much debt they would be in um, after leaving that institution. Um, so research shows that across the country, Americans do lack a proficient understanding of finances. Um, which really do impact, um, impact them later on in life. Also, parents were surveyed and 95% of those parents felt it was important and necessary for their child to have this understanding and to receive a course in high school where they would learn about financial, finances and concepts. So this course, um, the financial literacy course, the overarching big theme of the course will be students will be able to learn basic finance concepts and they'll be able to use them to make wise financial decisions to promote a financial well-being over their lifetime. Um, so it's really going to be a lot of knowledge building, but then also incorporating a lot of application, like what do these concepts and skills mean in the real world? Um, so some of the concepts and skills that uh, students will be learning throughout this course, um, Sarah has already mentioned a few of them, but just modern, modern banking, introduction of financial concepts, theft and fraud protection, employment, income, budgeting, um, oh, sorry, thinking about higher education and financing that, thinking about student loans and borrowing money, um, thinking about credit, insurance, and um, thinking about the economy and um, thinking about starting your own business. 
which are all really important skills that that students need to have in order to navigate um, in, later on in, in their career and in life. Um, so this course, as I mentioned, will have a math teacher that is fully instructing the, the course, but it also will be embedded with some online digital learning platform. And we would be using EverFi. EverFi is a um, nonprofit organization that does have a very well high quality um, learning platform with interactive lessons that our students would be able to um, engage in so that they were acquiring these skills and concepts. So throughout EverFi, there are modules to engage students in real life application and skills. There are pre and post assessments to measure students' growth along the course. There will be supplemental lessons for live instruction and peer collaboration. Um, EverFi does offer professional development training. So whichever teacher chooses to teach this course will have EverFi um, provide them professional development and really make sure that they understand the skills and concepts that they need to teach. And also they understand how to work through the online learning component. Um, all the modules have a performance-based task that students will be engaged in that will mirror that application skill and will allow them to practice these real life concepts and skills. And every lesson is aligned to the national financial literacy standards, including the Common Core ELA literacy standards. Some of the modules that are offered in EverFi that our students will have an opportunity to engage in. Um, Venture is one of the modules where students really get a sense of learning about how do you start your own business? How do you create a business plan? How do you do some market research? Um, so that's a real intense uh, module. It's actually one of the modules at the end of the course where students will kind of use all of their knowledge and skills about um, financial literacy and then apply it to a real world application. Um, they'll also learn about financing their higher education. So they'll have an opportunity to learn about what are some options and choices that they have when they plan um, how they'll pay for educational costs, how they'll budget their money and how they will um, be responsible for their education loans as they move on in their careers. Um, and then two other modules that students will engage in, and these are just a few. Um, Money Moves, who talks a lot about online banking, talks about having students learn about credit and debt and talks about protection and fraud. Um, and really important skills that our students need to, need to know as they navigate these things uh, later in life. And then one of the last modules is just around marketing and economics and, and giving students an understanding of how government and corporations work in the financial marketplace. So that's just a very big picture of what this course will look like. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, I think it's important to know that this is like the pilot year. This is our first year of having this course in the fall. So we will certainly be monitoring student growth and looking at um, you know, feedback from our students and the teacher um, to make sure that this is a very engaging course that meets our expectations and meets um, our stand, our, the uh, financial literacy standards for our students. Thank you, Christina. Welcome, Henry and Almi. Um, Mr. Jimenez, yeah, go may, ahead. I, may I go ahead and ask a question? I'm just looking at the clock because I know we have other agenda items too, if that's okay. I wasn't sure. Yeah, yeah, folks have, um, I actually, so I have to run to another meeting at six, um, so I won't be able to make it to the policy. Um, uh, but if we have kind of quick questions, we can do that. Um, and if, uh, Christina, if you can stay a little bit longer, maybe we can do it after the other presentation as well. Um, but yeah, if folks have like quick questions, maybe let's do like one or two questions now. And if folks have more, we can do it after. Great. Um, so Christina, hi, I thank you for your presentation. And I, and I certainly want to look into this some more as well. It's a great opportunity. I think we've all discussed how important this is, especially um, at this particular grade level for our students. Um, you mentioned that, is it EverFi? Forgive me. Yes, ever. Okay. Um, you just mentioned that it's your first pilot year. So my first question was going to ask, you know, what have you done this in other schools and what's been, you know, sort of your experience, but is this the first year for Chelsea or in general for EverFi offering this program? This is actually a very, this is a new course that EverFi is offering. 
to it's it's a nonprofit organization and they have different um, courses online, like they have a lot of SEL courses um, that some of our students at Chelsea High are using. Our teachers are using them actually during their um, Wednesday intervention blocks. This is the first time Chelsea will be using the finance literacy course, and it is a new course that Everfi has just um, created, and that is why they are offering, one of the reasons why they're offering professional development to whatever teacher will be using this resource. Um, and providing that throughout the course. Great, thank you. Um, this is Rosemary Carlisle. Hi, Rosemary. Uh, hi, Christina, I'm sorry. I'm Rosemary Carlisle, senior member of the Chelsea School Committee. Um, I wanna thank you for this. I think this is gonna be an awesome program for the children. Did you say what grade this was gonna start in? I, did I miss something? So this is an elective course that will be offered through the math department at the high school. And it is for anyone in grades K, uh, nine through 12. So anyone at high school who can fit it into their schedule um, will be able to take this course. I think that is awesome because um, I, I had spoken to a couple of students not going to Chelsea High, but they don't know how to write out checks. <laughs> okay, so I think this is gonna be an important aspect of their lives to learn how to write out checks and stuff like that. So I think this is good. We used to have business courses years ago and we had to do away with them, but I think this is gonna be an awesome thing for the students. Thank you very much for your presentation. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Christina, I have saved them perhaps for an email just for the sake of time. Thank you so much. Sorry for the background noise. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this is super exciting. Thank you so, so much. Um, all right, so uh, since we don't have to take a vote on this, we will move to the next item on the agenda, which is the Advisory Committee on Ethnic Studies. Um, I have a couple, a couple of quick slides for to share with you all. Um, pull that up. So, um, so kind of just this idea came up, uh, you know, as, as I've been thinking about, you know, We've been talking a lot about like culturally responsive curriculum, right? And like like how, how to make sure that we're empowering students, um, uh, you know, through the use of curriculum to make sure that students see themselves reflected um, in in the curriculum. Um, I have had a lot of conversations with folks in the you know previous few years, especially you know even prior to my to my election, around um, the idea of ethnic studies uh, as a way to empower students and really um, get students engaged with their identities and really thinking more deeply about it. And so, um, the idea of this advisory committee, I'll, I'll, so I'll, what I'll do is I'll first, uh, I'll, I'll share a little bit about what ethnic studies is. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about, um, kind of the, the advisory committee and then, um, you know, we'll have some, some questions. So let me just quickly, So I'll try to run this, uh, run through this as, as quickly as I can, um, but please um, feel free to ask me questions if you have them. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll talk what is ethnic studies, why is this a good idea, then talk about the committee and then open up for questions. So ethnic studies is, uh, so it's an academic discipline. It was founded in the 1960s mm -hmm. in San Francisco, and it was really inspired by the, the civil rights movement, by right? these, these ideals of racial harmony, participatory democracy, um, and it really includes uh, the critical study of race, ethnicity, indigeneity, um, and these other intersectional identities, right? So including like gender, sexuality, you know, nationality, all these different things, um, with the, really a focus on the experience and perspectives of people of color, right? And um, as I've been talking with people who, who do this for, for work, who teach this, right? A, a lot of the things that, they, that, they, that they've said is around, this isn't as much content as it is pedagogy, which is how we actually teach. So it's geared towards making school really relevant and engaging to students by challenging them to think about themselves, right? And their identities. And then through that process, helping them think about understanding not just themselves, but how society sees them, right? So helping them really understand um, all, the, all these different things. And you know, even though race is at the forefront, um, like I mentioned, people come at this with their, you know, the, all the intersections of identity Right, so it, it's really about recognizing the humanity in everyone, which also then helps to elevate the relationship between the educator and the student. So, so um, the ethnic study has really been um, uh, really great for developing stronger student-teacher relationships um, from the conversations that I've had. And ultimately, it's about like it, it's about your collective story. So, part of the part of the, the ethnic studies 
um, work is you learn to tell your own individual story, right? And then as you're able to tell your own story, you're able to see patterns in it that bring it from the individual story to the collective story, right? As your, as your story individually becomes part of your family story and your broader community story. And so one key component of ethnic studies is that it has to be really customized to the local context. So it doesn't look the same if it's taught in California where it started or in Arizona where they've had it for a few years or in Massachusetts where right now we have it in Boston and in Holyoke. And what you're really doing is connecting your story to the broader story of where you are and how your people came to be in this place right now today. Um, and kind of before I talk about the next part, I wanted to highlight this quote from MLK. Um, An individual has not started living until he or she can rise above the narrow confines of his individualistic concerns, the broader concerns of all humanity, right? So it's not about like the individual, it's about then connecting it to the story and the change that we want to create um, as a society. So once you understand this collective narrative, right, students then realize that, oh, you're not alone, right? This is, you're part of a bigger thing. And then the question becomes, so what now? What can you do with this collective understanding? And so ethnic studies really tries to engage students to get them to think about what is normal? Why is it normal? And then that way you can really challenge the notion of having to accept your lot in life, right? And instead we empower students to be a force for change in our community, right? So a key component is really activating youth to, to use their voice, empowering them to create change in their communities by getting involved. So that was a lot of, um, you know, kind of aspirational words, right? Um, but I, I really deeply believe that one of the most basic purposes of education is to prepare our students to be engaged citizens in our society. And that's why I really believe this is such an important discipline to engage our students in. Well, let's actually talk about, you know, what are the benefits of this? Because I think that's really, really important. Um, so uh, Stanford researchers did a collaboration with um, San Francisco School District um, where they actually piloted ethnic studies between 2010 and 2014. And they targeted low performing students and compared them to students who didn't take the course. And what they found is that there were big increases in attendance, uh, 21 percentage points, um, big increases in GPA, 1.4 GPA uh, increase, and also an increase in the number of credits that students took by the time uh, of graduation. And those um, uh, improved outcomes were particularly good for boys and uh, Latinx students. And in terms of GPA, also really good for math and for science. Um, and the courses also really promote social emotional learning and they help students and communities to recognize and celebrate their diversity, right? So as we're thinking about the diversity within our community, right? These courses really help to foster pride and dignity, mutual respect and understanding and uh, collaboration across cultures. Um, so that's kind of the, the, kind of the quick overview of ethnic studies. So now I'll just mention quickly about the advisory committee. So the advisory committee, it, they kind of do four things, right? Um, the first thing is they would kind of review the relevant research on ethnic studies to get a better understanding of what it is and how it works. Um, they would also connect with other districts and experts that have done it um, to understand what it would take to do something like this in Chelsea. One really important part is engaging the CPS community about ethnic studies to make sure that this is something that the community wants as well. And uh, so it's really uh, partially, it's about organizing in the community to make sure that, that, we, that we are interested um, and, and that we do it in a way that, that targets what the community ultimately wants. And then also understanding any other considerations that we might have to take uh, in terms of implementation. Um, and then ultimately the committee will come up with recommendations um, to the school committee about whether we should pursue a pilot program at some point Number two would be a timeline for the implementation of that program, right? And like what folks think would be a good timeline. Um, and then three would be any additional considerations that we should take into account um, in order for the project to be successful. And so as we're thinking through the timeline, um, the idea would be we would move this to the full school committee next week. Um, and then in April, um, kind of late March uh, or during April, we would identify and name the members of the um, advisory committee the committee would then meet for the rest of the year. And then in February, 2022, um, they would present the full report with final recommendations. And then um, in the budget process for next year, we would kind of find ways to implement whatever recommendations there might be from the, from the committee. Um, and I, I forgot to include this here, but I can share the, um, 
the composition. So the composition uh, right now as it stands as, as proposed would be three members of the school committee uh, or up to three members. Um, it doesn't have to be that many. Um, we mm -hmm. would include um, two students from the high school, one teacher from the high school and one teacher from the middle school and um, two parents um, from the community as well as um, uh, Sarah as, um, as our curriculum person and Aaron as our um, diversity officer for the district. So that is my quick presentation. Um, yeah, I was wondering if folks had any questions or thoughts. Anything. Roberto, I have a quick question. Yes. Well, several. One, um, who, I know the committee will be comprised of seven members, but who will be deciding who will be on this committee and what's the process of um, joining the committee? Yeah, so that's that's a question, I guess, for the committee to decide. Um, uh, ultimately, the um, so the, the 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 resolution or not a resolution, right? The, the proposal, right, includes the superintendent naming the um, the parents and the students, um, and I I think we should come up with a way to to kind of like gather you know applications or something or at least like interest from people, right, and. Um, when it comes to the educators, that process, um, you know, the the CTU would nominate folks, but then ultimately the decision would be up to the superintendent, and then uh, the chair of the school committee, um, in this case, um, would would not would name the school committee members to be on the board on the committee. Okay, that's helpful. And another question is related to, and I know you have to get going, Roberto. Yeah, so no thank you for your time. But oh, my question is uh, related to. This is wonderful, and I'm in full support. However, lots of this work needs a lot of training, right? As an educator myself, um, I would, I personally would feel ready for, for something like this, but I know some educators are not, and some educators are still not so entirely comfortable talking about these things. And so I wonder, and again, I don't have the document in front of me, and I apologize for that, um, but what would be the process in preparing our educators to pass this wonderful information along and this initiative along throughout the district? Absolutely. So two two quick things about that. One, that's part of what the committee would be trying to figure out, right? Like what is the right timeline to make sure that we implement this and we do it correctly, right? And like to make sure that we, we can do it in a way that accomplishes all the things that you just mentioned, right? And making sure that we have um, good, you know, educators who know how to do this and are, are prepared to do this. Um, and then the other uh, pieces, right, we have the ability also, we are hiring, like, like we're going to be hiring a lot of folks, right, if we hopefully continue to get this money from the SOA and kind of growing numbers um, each year. So that would kind of give us more flexibility to if we need to hire folks to, to be part of this, right, we could do so. So, so, so really, okay, like, what you. it comes down to, right, is this committee is not making decisions. It's really just like, getting an understanding of what this all is and how it could work and then making recommendations to us to then figure out how we're actually going to implement it, right? And, and, and we would kind of the committee would deliberate and then we would then next year talk about this more with the superintendent, with you know the rest of the central office, with the rest of the community as well. Okay, gracias. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right. Can we make a motion to submit this to the the um, a vote for towards the school committee? I'm sorry, to the school committee. Okay. No, right. Motion to yeah to move it to the school committee. Do I have a second? Yeah, I have a second. But could you possibly send the information ahead of time to the rest of the members of the committee so they can read about it and get a little more information about it before the yeah. next meeting? Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it was in the um. Uh, I'll I'll send the I'll send the slides along, but um, the the proposal itself was in the um in the email that went out to folks. But okay. I will I will send out the slides. Thank you. All right. So second by Rosemary. Um, do I have any opposed? Seeing none opposed. Um, that is moved to the school committee. Um, seeing no other items on the agenda, I think that's it. Um, does anybody have any other um? things or comments they would like to add. Okay. Um, oh, the one thing I'll mention, um, I, I did speak with the, the person who is now the ethnic studies coordinator for the Boston Public Schools. 
um, she is available to come to our, um, our meeting next week so that if folks in the committee have kind of questions that they would like to ask somebody who's like actually doing this work, um, she, she will be there to kind of answer any questions. Um, yeah. All right, uh, do I have a motion to adjourn this meeting? Uh, Roberto, before part yeah. in, before we make a motion, um, just make sure that if you know you want to have her come and present on this, that that's noted on the agenda. You know, mm -hmm. doesn't get lost in public speaking. If that's what yeah, you want to, she won't be coming know. to present. She oh, would just be there as a resource to answer questions if folks have them. Okay. Yeah, but I'll, but I'll, I'll touch base with Dr. Veda. Yep. Okay. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> make a motion. All right. Um, Rosemary, I'll take that as a second. <laughs> second. <laughs> Great. Um, seeing none opposed, meeting adjourned at 6.04. Okay, so is it okay, Almi, is it okay to just get us right into yeah. policy and procedures? We got thumbs up here. Okay. And Adam. Go right to it. Yes, sir. <laughs> All right, so we I have actually four policies for you tonight. Um, I can provide a little bit of um, context as to why we need to do this, and then um, hopefully we can get a motion to move these to full school committee. Um, so the first three policies, one is for foster care, um, which you may recall we've approved a previous policy uh, for it, so we do need to update that one. Um, the second policy yeah. is for our homeless students. The Pardon, third Adam. I'm so sorry. Is, is it possible that you could do a screen share and, put, and have the agenda up? I was just trying to pull it up on my screen, but for folks to actually have it up. Does anybody have the ability to do that yes, for I their screen share? Thank you. Okay. Can you all see that? Yes, thank you. All right, so the first one is the foster care policy. Then we have a homeless students policy and a military, military students policy. All three of those policies fall under the umbrella of educational stability. Um, so we have uh, recently been in the process of undergoing an educational stability tiered focus monitoring review. And as part of that review from DESE, it has been determined that we needed to update uh, these three policies. Um, so all three policies have been uh, sent to you in advance and I can pull them up on my screen, um, but they have all been pulled from the MASC uh, October 2019. So they're uh, essentially pre-approved and I can give you just a brief summary. Um, what, what they're basically all trying to do is ensure uh, the stability of education for these three types of students that we have. Um, so students in foster care, students without um, uh, stable housing, and students who might be the children of uh, parents who are deployed in the military. And all three of those students without these policies could possibly result in changing schools left and right, which is never good for anybody. So this gives them lots of rights in terms of um, remaining in their home, uh, home school of origin. Uh, very similar to uh, the McKinney Venti, uh, McKinney Vento policy that we've had in place. Um, so I'm, I'm, I can go through them one by one with a little bit more detail. And before I do that, I'll just um, mention what the fourth policy is. It's a very brief one um, for our student athletes participating in our pooled testing. Uh, many districts are um, utilizing the same idea. And the idea is basically that um, any students playing sports for Chelsea high school uh, would need to um, be required to participate in our uh, pooled COVID-19 testing program. Um, and if they weren't, um, if they did not participate, they wouldn't be able to uh, participate in the pooled testing program, they would not be able to participate on the team. Um, it also has another stipulation that basically says that um, if we have a positive student athlete, we would quarantine the entire team because it's really difficult to do accurate contact tracing for a basketball team who's probably very close to one another for a lot of the time. Um, so I can jump into each policy individual, but I, I'll, I'm happy to take any like general questions first.
Um, Adam, would there be a way, I don't know that you would need to take us through all of them, but is there a way that you wanna, unless folks absolutely think we need to, but I, I think most of the stuff we, you know, folks have seen before, unless it's there's something like critically different that you think that would be a good highlight under each. Um, but I think it's safe to say a lot of us went through the attachments. So yeah, I mean, sure I'm, I'm certainly happy to, difference. certainly happy to take the lead of the subcommittee. Um, I know you all received these in advance. Um, and, you know, so I gave a little brief summary overall of what, what they mean. And essentially, they, they do say the same things, but they get into definitions. So what does it mean to be a military student? You know, and, and it gets into the legal definitions of, uh, you know, you would need to be the, the child of someone in uh, deployed in active duty. Um, it includes U.S. National Guard and so on and so forth. Um, but if, yeah, I mean, I'm happy to go through the details if you like, but if you guys are um, familiar with the policies, I can take questions or, you know, we can dive right into making motions. It's up to you. Does anybody have questions for Adam regarding any of these policies? I will say it might be worth looking at the student athlete one because it is entirely new. Um, and I'm happy to pull that one up if you like. And it's only about two paragraphs. Can you please, Adam? Thank you, Adam. Gyms, museums, offices, you name it. House of worship, included in that too. Can folks mute if the background? Thank you. Yeah, so um, really what this says is it's only in place in law as long as we have our testing program. Um, and basically it says if you if you wish to participate on an athletic team, you have to sign a consent form or you're, if you're under 18, your parent has to sign the consent form that shows permission for the student to participate in the testing program. In order for the student to maintain membership on the team, that student must participate in the program, including submitting samples via nasal swab, saliva, or whichever test uh, type the district may adopt, because it is possible that we shift our, our testing type as we move along in this. Um, testing should occur no more than weekly, but in the instance of pool testing, the student, if identified in a positive pool, would then have to participate in reflex testing, because pool testing tests a whole bunch of people at once. The reflex testing tells us who the actual positive person is. Um, in the event that a student athlete is positive, um, it is highly likely through contact tracing that the entire team would need to quarantine according to whatever the most recent DESE or DPH guidelines are at the time. Um, and that student athlete that is positive would also need to isolate according to the most recent DESE and DPH guidelines. Um, it is limited to the beginning and end of the season. So when basketball season's over, the basketball players do not need to continue to participate, although they would be welcome to do so, and we would still encourage them to. Um, and it, in, the, in the event that a student doesn't meet the requirements, um, they'll receive a verbal warning um, after the first offense, a written warning after the second offense, and possible, we're leaving possible in there for some wiggle room, possible removal from the team after the third offense. Thank you, Adam. Um, does anybody here have any questions about the student athlete uh, testing policy? I, I do have one, but I, I will save it for the end for folks that have questions. Uh, Ms. Santiago, I have a quick question for Adam. Adam, um, are there thoughts about, you know, being worried about the amount of student athletes that could potentially be testing positive as a result of, um, you know, as a result of constantly testing and then having 14 day quarantine, I worry about students being able to play if we if they constantly have to quarantine. So the idea is that if if they're quarantining, it would be because someone on their team is positive. Um, and the quarantining right now, there are uh, three options. So one is a seven day quarantine, one is a 10 and one is a 14. Um, the reason why that seven day quarantine is there is because if you have no symptoms at all, um, 
and we have to allow the incubation period to, to happen. So if you and I are on the same team and I'm positive, it's possible that I might give the virus to you and due to close proximity and, you know, kids are um, perspiring quite, quite a bit in, in, in many high school sports. So it can, it can transmit that way. Um, but what happens is you might not test positive for the first couple of days because of the incubation period. So we have to do it for at least five days. And then um, you would have to get tested on day five. And if that all happened, then you could return on day seven. Got it, okay, thank you. Any other questions for Adam regarding the student athlete policy, testing policy? Well, I wanted to ask, I think it was sort of just on that, on that question, very similar to Kelly, I think immediately I was thinking about the actual sports program and what that might look like. Um, I know that we're in conversations about reopening and also the phase in of all our students or you know, what that pro the, the plan will actually look like. Um, so I'm also curious to hear more on how this, uh, this relates to the sports programs. Um, and so for me, it's hard to wrap my head around this, but even, even trying to visualize and think like if all our programs are up and running, this is specifically about the testing policy. Um, so I appreciate that there's some measures in there. I think that it's good to hear, you know, that we're thinking about these things. Um, just for me, it's hard to sort of, you know, think about it all without knowing what the sports program is actually going to look like. Um, but all that said, I think it's a great effort. I think it's great that we're planning ahead, um, you know, and I think that having some testing available and a commitment from students that in order to be able to have the privilege to play that, you know, we have to think about, you know, shared responsibility and caring for each other, you know, as we continue along. So uh, thank you for bringing that forward and like putting that, you know, your pen to paper and, um, and for us to be able to take a look at that today. Yeah, I think our kids, our kids want to play sports. Um, and they've been really robbed of that. And there is some inherent risk, which is why we want to put the testing in place. And the MIAA has also put a number of rule changes in place to minimize spread as well. Personally, I can tell you, I, I coach and in my own town, I coach a baseball team and a basketball team currently both running at the same time right now. Uh, those are two sports that we're hoping to run at Chelsea High School. Um, and I can tell you that we, we, we take the the guidelines really seriously. Um, we have followed all the rules and, you know, I coached all through the spring as well. Um, and luckily we didn't deal with a single positive case. Um, and I think that's due to the mitigation strategies that are in place. It is possible that we might have a positive case if we do this. And that is some risk that, you know, we're asking our student athletes if they, if they do want to play, they might, you know, they might have to um, tolerate some of that risk. Um, but the testing program, I think, will be a key linchpin in being able to um, minimize the possibility of that happening. And I do think the benefits outweigh, outweigh the risks in this point, but it is ultimately up to our, our kids and our families to decide um, if they want to be able to play. And, and we, you know, we, we feel confident that in offering it, it will be safe. Great. Thank you, Adam. Um, is there a motion to, anybody have a motion to send this forward to the school committee? I'll make a motion to send it, send it to the full school committee meeting. And second. We'll need a second to move it forward. Is there also any other questions for Adam before we move on? Sorry about that, but there's a motion on the table. <laughs> I'll second it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Adam, for your presentation and your work on these um, and for taking the time to review um, the updates to the policies for us. You know, I, I'll just say for all of us to do our due diligence and, you know, take another look at it, you know, th more thoroughly if we have any other questions to bring them forward. But um, it sounds like, as you mentioned, it's coming from, you know, the Massachusetts uh, MSAC here. Um, so it, it sounds like it's, it's good that we're getting up to speed and that we'll be up to date on these policies. So to be clear, the motion was for all four policies. I think that one was for actually the school, um, I'm sorry, for the sports athlete testing policy. So 
is there a motion to accept uh, updated policy <laughs> for uh, the first three of the, the items are gone off the agenda, Adams? So I can't. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, uh, I stopped sharing. Okay. Thank okay. you. My motion, my motion was to accept all four, so we can put it all in one, one. Okay. Thank you. Um, is there a second to accept all four? Second. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you, Adam. Um, right. I just need to peek back at the agenda. I think we might be in good time, but I just want to double check. Okay, that looks like we might be covered. Do folks have any other questions related to what we discussed today before we adjourn? Okay, the motion make to a motion adjourn. to adjourn. There a second. 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 <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Meeting adjourned. Thank you all so much.